Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation webinar. Today, we are very pleased to bring to you um, Dr. Lionel Fonqua from Mayo Clinic, along with uh, Michaela Schmidt, the research fellow with uh, Dr. Lewis Roberts from Mayo Clinic. Um, Dr. Fonqua is going to tell us a little bit about a clinical trial that they are uh, now opening up at Mayo Clinic for cholangiocarcinoma patients. And um, Dr. Schmidt is going to tell us a little bit about the GWAS study um, and what it means and how we can participate. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Fonqua. Okay. Thank you. Just give me a second here to pull up my slides. And while you're pulling up your slides, I'm just gonna let everyone know that if you have any questions as he's presenting, please go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A um, down at the bottom of your screen and we will make sure that he can get them answered. All right. So, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. It's coming, yep, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna switch here to Presentation mode, okay. Can you guys all see okay? It is great, thank you. Okay. Perfect. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lionel Fonqua. I'm one of the uh, hematology oncology fellows at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Melinda and uh, the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation for inviting us to present uh, this uh, clinical trial. Um, and so it's my pleasure on behalf of a big group uh, to present this study. Uh, the principal investigator on the study is Dr. Lewis Roberts. And uh, as you can see here, we have a, a number of co-investigators. Really, it's a multidisciplinary collaborative effort uh, involving hepatologists, uh, hematologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists, interventional radiologists, and obviously also some uh, basic scientists, immunologists. Um, so. I'm really presenting on behalf of, of a big group here. So the title of the, 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 the study is uh, Modify Immune Cells, uh, Autologous Dendritic Cells, uh, and uh, combined with the vaccine after uh, a high dose uh, uh, external beam radiation therapy uh, for patients uh, with unresectable uh, primary liver cancers. So um, I'm gonna, for here. So as you know, primary liver cancers are mainly, when we say primary liver cancers, referring to hepatocellular carcinoma, which is uh, a cancer of the liver tissue. Uh, you know, that's the seven most common cancer worldwide and second leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Uh, uh, more than two-thirds of those patients are diagnosed are not candidates for uh, curative therapies, uh, and most of them eventually develop a progression of disease uh, with local regional treatment leading to a five-year survival of about less than 20%. The other uh, type of primary liver cancer is, we already know, it's a cancer of the bile ducts as opposed to the primary liver tissue. Uh, and those are the tubes that carry digestive fluid uh, uh, bile within the liver. Second leading cause of primary liver cancer. Uh, radiation therapy is an option, it's a treatment option, uh, and has been those in, uh, used in locally advanced setting with limited success. So eventually these patients uh, end up progressing on, 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 on local regional uh, treatment. So that's why, you know, for these patients that are not surgical candidates that we can operate and hopefully cure, you know, we, what are, they're very limited options. And that's why we have this study to kind of uh, push the envelope and offer uh, some options for this uh, patient group. So cholangiocarcinoma, again, just to make sure uh, we're referring to the same thing, you're probably familiar with this uh, diagram. This is a liver. Uh, like I said, the number of primary liver cancers we're talking about here, uh, the liver ducts. As you can see here, there's a number of them, starting with the, the, the main common bile duct here and then branching into what we call the hepatic ducts. But what we're referring to, what we're interested in here is those ducts, the dark green ducts that are within the liver. That's the, the subset of patients here that you can see are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So that's what we're interested in here. That's the, that's the, the patient group that we're targeting here. Um, so uh, before I get into uh, 
the trial itself, I think it's important to understand the rationale, why we want to do this. And there's some science, and I'm going to try to hopefully convey uh, the, the rationale for the trial uh, uh, quickly here. So the immune system, as you know, the, the immune system, one of the many functions of the immune system is to recognize and destroy foreign organisms, foreign pathogens, and also cancer cells. However, uh, cancer cells uh, can outsmart the immune system. They can find ways to hide or even disable the immune system from acting against them. Um, and so we need to, the been immunotherapy, as you probably know, has been a growing and expanding field. Uh, and there are a lot of strategies, different strategies, uh, looking at, you know, boosting the immune system's uh, ability to fight against the cancer because I mean if you can harness your own immune system that's easier than giving you uh, chemotherapy or other forms of therapy so that's that's the role of the immune system and that's how it's going to play here specifically there's there are many cells in, in the immune system and there's one type of cell called the dendritic cells they also called um, uh, professional uh, antigen presenting cells uh, that's because their role is they kind of like the link between the immune system and the rest of the body, uh, uh, the rest of the world. And their, their role is to identify uh, foreign pathogens, foreign organisms, and then present them to the immune system. Uh, and then uh, stimulate, hopefully in that, in that way, stimulate uh, an immune response. So they sample the environment, they sense pathogens, uh, they present those antigens and, and, and kind of start that adaptive immune response. Uh, and um, uh, so, so they're very, a very uh, important type of cell. And that's why the focus is going to be on dendritic cells. Uh, as you can see here, this is a nice schematic uh, from Science uh, years ago that shows a dendritic cell actually presenting or linking here uh, and interacting with a T cell. Those are the, what we call the cytotoxic cells that actually kill. That's the killing cells of the immune system. So these cells are more of a mediator, it mediated the, 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 the immunity against uh, foreign pathogens. So radiation therapy, some of you may or may not be familiar uh, of radiation therapy, but it's the use of radiation uh, to target or to destroy uh, a tumor uh, uh, by damaging the DNA of the cancer cells. Uh, and uh, the, why, the reason why we use radiation here, why the reason why radiation therapy is actually important in this, in this setting is because it causes a type of cell death that we call immunogenic, meaning uh, the way the cells die allows the, the, the release of uh, uh, tumor-specific uh, proteins that are, that are gonna trigger an immune response in that environment. Uh, so that's why it's very important. As you can see here on the diagram, you have the irradiation here, and there's a lot of cells in what we call the milieu or the microenvironment, the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and uh, so by destroying that, by applying radiation energy there, you're not only destroying the cells, the tumor cells, but in the process, they release a lot of these antigens that can be recognized by the dendritic cell that you can see here on the far right. Uh, and that dendritic cell is going to sample and recognize what's foreign, what's abnormal, and alert the immune system and hopefully activate uh, uh, an immune reaction hopefully in this case against the cancer uh, uh, and the cancer uh, uh, specific proteins. So with that background, you know, this study was designed to, it's kind of an early phase study to, to study the, the, the safety and the tolerability of autologous dendritic cells. So dendritic cells are those, modif those immune cells. Autologous means from the patient's own cells. And I'm gonna explain that a little further on the next slide, but we harness in your own cells. We modify a little bit in the lab and then we give them back to you uh, in conjunction with another vaccine called a vaccine called Prevna. That's the pneumonia vaccine. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. This, again, this is to boost that immune system. And then we combine that with radiation therapy uh, for patients that are not eligible for surgery. Uh, so that's the main objective here. Obviously, why are we doing that? You know, we're hoping to learn more about how the body the body, the, the immune, the body's immune system is, is reacting to this, uh, to these uh, combination of therapy. So we'll be monitoring, we'll be checking blood along the way to kind of get a sense of what can we learn, what can we, what work, what didn't work, and what can we uh, hopefully improve upon. So the study schema, uh, and I'm going to kind of walk you through this, uh, starts with the first, obviously, you're going to get registered, and at baseline, we get a scan, a baseline scan, and a biopsy to really make sure that you truly have uh, uh, the diagnosis of uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And then the first cycle uh, is, uh, after you register, the first cycle is pretty much entails 
uh, first apheresis. And apheresis, for those of you not familiar, is pretty much we put an IV in your uh, in, in, an intravenous line and we get blood uh, from you, just like a blood draw, and we isolate immune cells. Uh, there are a lot of different types of immune cells, uh, but the ones that we isolate are monocytes. Those are immature uh, immune cells. Uh, those actually can be good or bad, actually can be bad, uh, and actually can prevent a response because they, their role is, they have a, a, a role in kind of maintaining uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the immune system in check. So they may actually be bad for an immune response. So they're immature. And what we do in the lab, we have a special lab that actually modifies them and gets them, uh, mature them into mature dendritic cells. So that process can take about three weeks. Uh, uh, and while that's going on, you will receive radiation therapy. Again, radiation therapy. So right after apheresis, after you've drawn blood, you can start radiation therapy. And radiation, you work with our radiation oncology team. That radiation, they will come up with an individualized plan for you based on your tumor location. And uh, the radiation therapy can, can vary from one to three weeks, depending on the technique that's uh, specific thing that's used. And during that time, we actually uh, process your, your own cells in the lab. Um, and um, like I mentioned earlier, radiation therapy causes immunogenic cell death. So, you know, you're going to have release as the tumor cells die, they're going to release in that environment, that tumor microenvironment, uh, uh, what we call a uh, uh, danger associated molecular patterns or and a big word to say uh, tumor specific proteins that are going to alert the immune system. So what, those are proteins that are going to be in the, in, the, in the environment, the tumor microenvironment. And um, uh, uh, those mature dendritic cells that were processed in the lab now are ready, once they are ready, they have the ability to, again, this is what the uh, highlight is, the MHC1 peptide complex is just a big term for, they have the ability to recognize foreign pathogens. Uh, uh, so once that's done, you're done with radiation therapy, we have the cells ready, mature. Now what we do is we start injections. So we start injecting these mature and really at the site of the tumor uh, while the tumor is dying with those proteins that have been released in that microenvironment. So we start that. So that's pretty much going to be cycle two through eight. And each cycle here is 28 days or a month. Uh, so, you know, you get an injection once a month, uh, you know, monthly injections. Halfway through here, after the, 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 the third injection, we get a scan to make sure to see how things are going, make sure that this is not progressing. Hopefully we see some shrinking. Uh, and with the first three cycles here, cycle two through four, we give you Prevnar. That's that vaccine, that pneumonia vaccine. And, and it's the rationale here is a boosting agent. It hopefully will boost your immune system early on here uh, 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 and, and improve that uh, immune reaction, uh, immune uh, response. So, and again, assuming the scan is looking great, no disease progression, you know, we'll continue with uh, on all the way to cycle eight. So you're gonna get a, get a total of seven monthly injections after you've completed uh, 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 apheresis and radiation therapy. So, and then at the end, we get another scan once you complete that to make sure things are still Okay, you dressing and other effects or you know unintended uh, uh, um, consequences from this, uh, and you then move into an observation uh, event monitoring phase, and that's pretty much in a nutshell the trial. Um, uh, you know it's a pretty uh, complicated uh, complex uh, if you're looking at it the first time, but very simple uh, once you 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 get you get uh, you get into it. So, so that's that. Um, in terms of criteria, I think the form should be posted on the website already, but in terms of inclusion criteria, I think those are pretty standard for most of the trials, but I'm gonna highlight the key ones here. Obviously adults uh, age uh, are greater than 18. Um, we need to have, like I mentioned, biopsy, tissue biopsy to make sure you truly have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. We do that at the baseline. Uh, you have to be unresectable, so can be treated with surgery for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, we have to have measurable disease. So we have to be able to see and measure the disease on scans. Uh, all lesions, you have a radiation oncology consult uh, right after, before registration. And we have to get a sense and approval from the radiation oncologist that they can actually easily treat this lesion with radiation therapy. 
Uh, and then the tumor also should be easily accessible for ultrasound guided injections. Remember, I told you after cycle one, we start the injections. So we have to make sure that uh, our interventional radiologists, they have to give their blessings and make sure that, you know, this is actually could be easily done because the last thing we want is to harm the patient. Uh, there has to be no evidence of tumor outside of the liver, except for uh, uh, tumor thrombus, uh, clots related to the tumor itself. Uh, and uh, we could use CT scan or MRI to kind of assess that. Uh, patients who are not candidates, again, for surgical treatment or for ablation are the ones we'll consider for this. So we have a tumor board where we look at every patient and we truly have to make sure that none of these other options are, 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 are available uh, for, for, to them. And then obviously you have to have a good performance status, uh, ECOG of zero or one. So relatively good, uh, you have to be able to perform some of the basic activities of daily living. In terms of the major exclusion criteria, any comorbid uh, systemic illnesses or severe disease, where it be uh, uh, heart disease, uh, diabetes, that's uncontrolled, anything that's uncontrolled, we will want you to get that under control before getting on the trial, because there's always potential that that could get worse uh, for whatever reason. Uh, if you're immunocompromised, uh, patients uh, with HIV on uh, antiretroviral therapy, that will be an exclusion criteria because, again, we're acting on the immune system here. And if you're already, uh, you don't, you're fighting, uh, you're immunocompromised, you're fighting a, a viral illness, we don't want to uh, um, uh, make that worse. Again, uncontrolled uh, intercurrent illness, I think I mentioned earlier, infections, heart failure, uh, heart disease, uh, or anything else that, uh, you know, significant, we want, that to, we want you to get that under control. Uh, any other active malignancy less than three years uh, prior to registration, except for a non-melanotic uh, skin uh, cancer or carcinoma in situ of the cervix, uh, you know, uh, otherwise it will be an, an exclusion criteria. Active autoimmune disease, again, you see a pattern here because we're acting on the immune system and there's potential to, to, to make things worse. We, we, don't, we wouldn't want someone who has autoimmune disease that's active. The key word here is active. If you have disease that's controlled on therapy, you would qualify for this, obviously on the closed monitoring. Uh, but anything active, we will want you to get that under control first. Uh, child pew class B or C, cirrhosis of the liver, will be an exclusion criteria. Uh, similarly, BCLC stage D uh, will be an exclusion criterion. Um, and Patients who have previously received immune modulating therapies, uh, you know, um, such as immune checkpoint inhibition or, or, or other similar therapies will be excluded from those. Uh, cortical steroids, as you know, are, are anti-inflammatory and kind of dampen the immune response. So they will actually have the opposite effect of what we want to do. Uh, so if you have cortical steroids used less than two weeks prior to registration, uh, we, that will be an exclusion criteria. Uh, the caveat here is patients on chronic steroids uh, may enroll if they have a less than equivalent of less than 10 milligrams per day of prednisone. So we, usually, we can convert that. We have patients on COPD on small dose of steroids, and uh, they can they can they can uh, they can they, they can still enroll. So that's in the nutshell the kind of the main uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, the last one here is prior liver radiation. So if you've already had radiation to the liver more radiation would probably be harmful, and that includes radioembolization. So the trial status, uh, we actually, uh, uh, is currently open and accruing. We have uh, we projected to have a 26 participant, 13 cholangiocarcinomas, and 13 HCC. Uh, we have two of 26 that have actually completed a protocol so far in, uh, in observation and monitoring. We would have had uh, more, but obviously the COVID-19 kind of has really affected our accrual, and we're hoping to pick things uh, uh, back up here. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you're interested, uh, you can feel free to, to reach out to myself. There's my email, but you could also reach out to our research coordinator, Jackie Wessling. Uh, there's her email and her, um, her uh, phone number. Uh, we'll be happy to talk about it in more details. And uh, we'll open it up for questions and the discussion. Yeah, so if anyone has any uh, questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, and I have a couple as we're going through. Um, right. During that process, will you be doing any profiling reports and following circulating tumor DNA reports or anything like that? Yeah, so, so not circulating tumor DNA, but we'll be doing uh, immuno, uh, uh, profiling, immunophenotyping using flow cytometry. So every, during every single one of these time points before and after each treatment, we'll be drawing blood and we'll be profiling the circulating immune cells and see how these levels correlate throughout the study. 
uh, we had a previous study that actually was kind of the, uh, the precursor to this uh, that we can compare to. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be doing that. And eventually uh, we'll be doing also some in vitro functional assays to try to see how uh, to assess the, the immune response. Okay. And then I think I'm going to ask, uh, George had a question. Is there pretrial evidence of vaccine effectiveness, for example, in mice? So vaccine effective, actually, there is, uh, when you say vaccine, I guess he's referring to dendritic cell vaccine. Uh, yeah, it's actually human, uh, uh, limited ev evidence in humans, and actually uh, uh, dendritic cells have been used for a while. However, uh, the caveat is in a lot of the dendritic cells, the quality of the dendritic cells uh, is actually very important. So a lot of the earlier trials or previous trials were using immature cells. And those can actually be harmful, uh, uh, you know, counter counter counteractive in terms of from an immune standpoint. So really maturing the cells, using the right cells, maturing the cells, characterizing those cells is very key. That's kind of the key to success here. And in, at Mayo Clinic, uh, we actually collaborating with Dr. DT, the, the head of our impact labs, a cellular therapy lab. Uh, and actually uh, he's the one his lab is the one uh, that the lab that's actually uh, characterizing and processing these cells and make sure they are ready. We've used these in glioblastoma; it's a type of brick tumor, and it's actually being used also in a, a similar trial in lymphoma. Uh, so we have evidence at Mayo Clinic that this approach is working uh, in uh, using uh, this specific dendritic cell uh, maturing or manufacturing technique. Okay. Um, another question from Marsha. If you have previously received the Prevnar vaccine, does that impact acceptance into the study? Not at all, not at all. Okay, wonderful. Um, so this brought back a lot of memories for me because I did the adoptive cell therapy, so I definitely know what apheresis is. And so I'm curious, how many um, cells are you going to grow into the lab? What are you, what are you looking to um, infuse back into the patient? But you're doing it by injection, and how does that work into the tumor? Can you describe how that will work? So yeah, I didn't put the specifics on there, but we're looking at 60 million cells, uh, 30 to 60 million cells, depending on uh, you know uh, how big the tumor is and how uh, uh, the yield of the phoresis. But uh, uh, the maximal dose is 60 million cells per injection. Uh, and we're doing intratumoral injections. So this is not into the blood. We're not giving it back. I know there's certain trials that just infuse it into the blood. We're actually doing intratumoral injections directly at the site where you know, um, um, uh, there's been cell death. Uh, that's the point here because, you know, as the, while the cells are in the process of dying, they're releasing those antigens, you want to put the, the cells, the immune cells right there so that they can right away capture those antigens and go back and present them to the T cells, those are those uh, killer cells, so that they can come back and not only attack the tumor at the site, but also if the tumor was anywhere else, actually go after. Uh, so it's a kind of a two, two, uh, two-fold approach here. You act, so there's a local effect, but also there's what we call a more distant effect, where if those antigens are present elsewhere, they'll be hopefully recognized by their immune cells. Wonderful. Um, so the injection, is that an outpatient procedure? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it's actually an outpatient procedure. So you come in into our interventional radiology suite, uh, we have a team uh, and uh, they will do the procedure. You'll be monitored for up to two hours after the injection, assuming everything goes well. Oops. He froze. Oh, uh, we will patient procedure. You will stay, you will stay, uh, you're not going to get admitted unless you have a complication. That's what we require for every patient to stay overnight in case there's a complication. If that's the case, they get admitted. We have a direct admission service that takes care of the, uh, our clinical trial patients. Okay, wonderful. One more question for me. Um, would this also be appropriate for the HCC um, cholangio combination patients when they have both? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, that's a good question. It will be appropriate for that and even patients who have uh, two tumors uh, or multiple lesions. You know, the, the, like I mentioned, the approach is not just at the site, but we're hoping to have a distant effect. So if you have two, that, that'll work as well. Okay. All right. So anyone else, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat um, and we will get them answered along the way. But we will move on to uh, Dr. Schmidt and her talk on the GWAS study. All right. Thank you. Again, I'm going to Thank stop. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Funkleth. 
Fantastic. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see this? Yes, yes. looks good. So like Melinda said, my name is Michaela Schmidt and I work with Dr. Lewis Roberts at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, our bile duct cancer genome-wide association study. So that's referred to as a GWAS, um, bile duct cancer, including cholangiocarcinoma, so CCA, and then also including gallbladder cancer, so GBC. And I'm going to go into what a genome-wide association study is, um, what we found so far, and then how you can participate. Feel free to put any uh, comments or questions in the chat as we go along, and I'd be happy to answer them. So just to start out, I want to recognize our collaborators in our first phase we call the discovery phase. The discovery phase um, was completed late last year, and now we're currently in analysis. So these are individuals, um, principal investigators from all over the world that have chose to participate in the study and provide um, samples from their sites. So these are the disclosures that we have. So as you guys, as I mentioned, cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer, we know that they're both rare and lethal. Um, we have some genome-wide association studies done, but they're very small. Very small genome-wide association studies don't give us a lot of information. Um, we need larger scale uh, studies to be able to um, determine what kind of genetic variations people have. Um, there has been a lot of work in more common cancers as far as gene variation. Um, and so we are trying to see what is significant um, as the smaller ones don't necessarily um, provide significant information. So we predict that there is, maybe, sorry about that. We predict that there's some genetic variations that put patients at risk of developing uh, cholangiocarcinoma. We know that PSC, patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis, are at a higher risk for CCA um, development, but we don't know why the majority of patients with PSC do not develop cholangiocarcinoma. Um, it is, like I said, the main association um, or predictor of CCA development, but the majority do not develop it, which is um, a weird pattern. Um, so we believe that we will be able to identify some of the molecular um, pathways that are involved in both non-PSC related cholangiocarcinoma and then patients originating with PSC and cholangiocarcinoma as a result of that. And then ultimately, we um, hope to identify these risk factors um, to uh, develop preventative interventions, targeted therapy, staging, um, prognosis, and other um, associated clinical factors that could influence positively the field of bile duct cancer. So, a genome-wide association focuses on SNP, um, so SNP, and it's the most common type of genetic variation among people. Um, so it's a variation in your genetic makeup. So there's nucleotides. They're labeled A, T, G, and C. And so you might have A, G, T, C, but someone else might have G, A, T, A. And so there's differentiation in that, and it calls for different genes to occur. So it accounts for why we have different eye color, why we have different hair color. Um, and so these genetic variations occur about once in a thousand nucleotides, which means that there's four to five million um, SNPs or genetic variations in a person's genome. Um, and 100 million SNPs are, occur in populations around the world. So there's different SNPs for different populations. 
um, that's typically found in the DNA between genes. So this can be a biological marker, as I said, to help identify um, genes that are associated with a disease. So perhaps we could target that disease or that we could identify patients at risk. Um, so we don't know for sure when we identify them, um, the direct role they have in the disease, but it gives us a narrower um, set of um, genes to focus in on in the basic side of science. So additionally, SNPs, uh, there's a ton of them that don't have any effect on health or development, um, but we have found that a lot of them actually do predict individual response to drugs, um, toxins, their risk of developing particular diseases. So like I said, there's larger um, diseases or more common diseases um, such as heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes that have identified SNPs associated with this. Um, and so for example, um, there's been a large amount of genome-wide associations on um, breast cancer. And so they've identified genetic variations, the SNPs, um, within patients with breast cancer. And then these SNPs are able to be looked at in a person's genome. So you could get genetic sequencing, um, and then you could see if perhaps your daughter has those uh, genetic variations that are associated with breast cancer. We know that this, having the SNP does not necessarily mean that you will get the disease, but um, with breast cancer, individuals might take um, more rigorous uh, prevention measures and screening to ensure that uh, they do not develop the disease since they're at higher risk. So, like I said, genome-wide association studies, there's a lot on here, um, but we pick out SNPs that we know, um, and it changes, like I said, just one makeup of your DNA. It's the smallest part of your DNA. Um, and we look at hundreds or thousands of SNPs at the same time, and then we look to pinpoint those genes that could potentially be further studied. Um, people with the disease, uh, are put into one group and then similar people, so same, similar age range, similar background, um, are also put in a group, those individuals without the disease. So we usually draw a blood sample and then um, harvest the cells within the blood. Um, and then we uh, refine the blood and pull out the DNA and then it's scanned on automatic laboratory machines and um, it picks up all the SNPs. Um, so the majority of people may have A's there, but we may see that in individuals with um, some disease may have a G instead of an A, putting them at risk. Um, like I said, the variants may not directly cause the disease, they just might be there and be variations that don't cause disease or don't um, code for anything particular. So on the left of this figure, you can see that we identify individuals with the disease. And on the right, we identify individuals without the disease. So um, on the top, the chip, so the, um, the device that we use to sequence has 5 million SNPs on it. Um, and so during the first round, we identify um, SNPs that are associated with no disease. So those are the ones that both the individuals with disease and the individuals without disease have. Then we um, find SNPs that have no association to the disease as well. So we're comparing the same um, SNPs that everyone has. But then we go in and we look at the SNPs where it isn't common among all individuals and it's more frequent in individuals with the disease. So those two groups, individuals with the disease, individuals without the disease, and we're um, comparing the genetic variations between the two. So as a part of our genome-wide association study, we are conducting the largest genome-wide association study in biliary tract cancers. 
um, with our focus being cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and so we use this screening assay, um, which is the collection of SNPs that we're focusing on in um, 2,600 cholangio cases and then 600 gallbladder cases. Um, and then we match them with similar patients without the disease. So that's the discovery phase. So we're just looking in general to see, are there differences? Um, but then what we need to do is a validation phase, which is what we're starting now. The validation phase is going to see if we can replicate what we found in the first phase. Um, and we're trying to increase the numbers um, to genotype more samples. And to, with that, we're able to better understand which SNPs are important and which ones are not important. So the larger the number of, the larger um, amount of cases, the better. Um, but we know that it being a rare disease, um, we are focused on about 5,000. Um, some diseases can have 15,000 um, samples, but in this case, um, 5,000 or um, even our 32,000 that we did in the discovery phase can be beneficial. And then we're gonna um, use whole genome-wide sequencing, which looks at every um, genetic variant in the genome. Um, so instead of looking at specific SNPs, we will look at every coding region of the um, genome. And we're working with a company in um, Iceland to do this. And then we will use that data to also look if there's variations outside of the SNPs we're looking at. So these are the institutions that um, graciously were involved with the discovery phase. Um, a large amount of collaborators all over the world. Um, within the discovery phase, we um, had a lot of Europeans, um, a larger amount of Asians, but we're looking for more diversity in the um, replication or validation phase um, because we know that there are different SNPs associated with different backgrounds. So we need to ensure that we're taking those into consideration. So by country, here's the totals. Um, on the left, you can see USA, Canada, Denmark, et cetera. And then the clangio cases that we had and the gallbladder cases we had, um, totaling that 2610 of clangio cases and then 668 gallbladder cancer um, samples. So just around 3,300 samples in this discovery phase. Um, in the discovery phase, we had a total of 2,400 European cholangiocarcinoma patients and then about 400 Asian cholangiocarcinoma patients. Um, and then we broke it down by intrahepatic, so about 900, extrahepatic, about 1,100. Um, and then we have PSC-associated cholangiocarcinoma, so our hope is to be able to compare patients with cholangiocarcinoma versus patients with PSC and cholangiocarcinoma versus patients without um, either of the diseases as well. Um, and so we are looking to increase that number. And you'll see later that we are working with the PSC partners, which is a similar organization focusing on individuals with PSC. And we're looking to recruit uh, more individuals with um, those two diseases. So this is a very um, complex graph, but I'm gonna try to walk you through it. Um, it's how we analyze um, the SNPs that we find. So this is European samples, both male and female, um, about 2,400 cases. So on the um, vertical side, the negative log of P is the significance. So is it significantly, is it significantly, Statistically significant, oh my goodness. Um, and so that red line is the threshold. So it needs to be higher than that to be significant um, in our analysis. So as you can see on the bottom, those are the chromosomes we have. So starting with one in the blue, then we go to chromosome two in the green, three in the blue, et cetera. So we are seeing a strong um, signal on chromosome six. Um, chromosome six is also has been found to be associated with PSC. Um, and so we are further analyzing if 
this is um, a correlation between PSC um, individuals and they have that signal or if it is something related to cholangiocarcinoma. Um, so within the chromosomes, there's a ton of different genetic variations. So we would look further into those. Um, you can now also see um, a significant SNP on chromosome two, um, chromosome four, and then chromosome 11. Um, these are not as prominent as you can see, um, but we are going to further investigate them to see if they do have significance. That will come with having more cases. So here's another one, and just to highlight, we are breaking them down by intrahepatic and extrahepatic. We also broke them down by males and females. So on this one, um, in intrahepatic, you can see a few signals, say on chromosome 15, chromosome 7, um, chromosome 6, um, but these are needed um, to be further studied before we can say that that's for sure associated with the disease. So um, we're not at the stage where we could tell individuals, go get genetic sequencing, and then if you have this, you're at risk. Um, we have many more studies to go and um, further work to be done on that, but ultimately the goal is that we could say um, this individual is at risk because you have this. So perhaps you have a child and your child goes in for genetic sequencing. We can see if this disease is uh, heritable. We don't know, um, but we're doing some work to see if um, there's association with the SNP in families, if it's passed down from uh, parent to offspring. Here's another one when we're comparing extrahepatic males samples. Um, it's a lot, but um, just on the right focusing that we see um, some individuals at the lower threshold or some SNPs at the lower threshold. And so that's a lot of them that we need to further study. So in our replication phase, like I said, we completed the discovery phase and are doing further analysis on that. Um, we currently have 15 North American sites and 12 European, Asian, African, and Australian institutions that are willing to participate in this replication phase. Um, we work with NCI to do this genotyping. Um, and then we are going to attempt to validate the no, novel genetic variants that we find um, with patients without PSC, but with cholangiocarcinoma. We're go then going to look at um, the genetic variations that we find um, that predispose cholangiocarcinoma development in patients with PSC. So kind of comparing the two different groups um, and seeing if there is a difference of why people with PSC don't always develop cholangiocarcinoma, but why some are at risk. And then we're gonna also look at the genetic variations that we found um, in the discovery phase uh, in gallbladder cancer and see if we can replicate those findings. And then ultimately we're gonna do a pooled analysis of risk factors for um, biliary tract cancers um, and see if there's SNPs that are associated with biliary tract cancers as a whole. Um, additionally, we're going to see um, if there's protein coding regions. So those are um, nucleotides, so the smallest uh, part of DNA that um, are associated with genes. So depending on the order of those nucleotides, that depends on what kind of protein that region codes for. Um, so like I said, that's um, the company at Decode Genetics that we're going to be working with to do the whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing rather than just the SNPs that I mentioned earlier. So ultimately we are, believe that our findings will help um, identify the important genetic factors that can help in um, determining the risk of an individual with cholangiocarcinoma, their survival, um, different prevention strategies and then targeted therapies um, for individuals, perhaps one SNP reacts uh, better than another individual with a different SNP, but both with clinical carcinoma. So these are the collaborators that we are, have established for the replication phase. Um, we've added some more international institutions, which we're very excited for. Um, based on estimates, we are looking that we could 
accumulate the 5,000 uh, goal. Um, and this is just a rough estimate. So some samples uh, have been accumulated and some are in the progress, in progress. So just a little timeline. We're going to, we started and did, completed the whole genome sequencing of the discovery. We did, I apologize, the whole genome wide sequencing of the discovery phase samples is going to take place shortly. So that's when we're looking at all coding regions of the DNA and not just those specific SNPs. And we're continuing to consent and blood collect and prepare DNA and data abstraction. So we're abstracting um, clinical information, the size of the tumor, um, risk factors. So perhaps um, do they have cirrhosis? Is there a patient with hepatitis? So those types of clinical data. And then um, we're having our site as well as other sites collect those samples. It started as soon as we pulled the validation samples, we began collecting. Um, and then we're going to do that genotyping again, and then an analyze that to see if we did replicate the results or findings that we're still um, analyzing from the discovery phase. Then what's going to happen is we're gonna make our own chip. Um, so the chip is the SNPs that we're focusing on um, to code for. And so that way we are able to look further into those um, SNPs and see um, why, the, not why those SNPs are occurring, but um, confirm with a smaller uh, selection of SNPs that those SNPs are um, in fact significant. And then we're going to genotype using that new assay that's specific for cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer. And then we'll do the whole genome-wide sequencing for the replication phase, and then do some final data analysis. Um, how can you help? We love patients that are willing to help us. Um, it's pretty simple. What happens is you go to the Cholangiocarcinoma um, Foundation website. Um, on that homepage, if you can see, um, it says patients, um, and you would click on that, the drop uh, bar, drop down uh, list comes, and then on the left side, it says enroll in a genetic study. You would click on that and on the page it'll give you some more information but ultimately you would go and submit your contact info information form now um, and the study coordinator study coordinator will follow up with you which is me um, and what will happen is i go through a consent form with you um, so it's a minimal risk study meaning that um, the risks associated with the study are that of a typical blood draw. So when you get a blood draw, they're opening the body. So you could, there's always a risk for infection. There's always a risk for bruising um, and discomfort at the site of blood draw, um, but it's minimal risk. So it's not uh, atypical from a typical blood draw. So what happens is you fill out the consent form, you fill out a basic information form, um, with your information so I can create a clinic account for you. And then what happens is I ship you a kit. The kit is um, very simple and you can take it to any laboratory that is local to you and convenient to you. What happens is it is um, in a cooler pack and so the lab knows exactly what to do. They FedEx it to us. So you just need to bring it to your lab. Um, I include an order so that um, typically, there's no problems with getting the blood drawn. If a fee is a, occur, if a fee occurs, um, then we do reimburse you for that. Um, it will likely not benefit you individually as a patient, um, just because we don't know what that genetic information uh, means. But as a whole, it will influence the field of uh, biliary tract cancers. Um, and so if you're interested, please go and uh, go on that contact form. Um, we, you don't have to have cholangiocarcinoma to participate. You can be a caregiver, an advocate, someone that's just interested um, in the disease and is willing to participate because we always need control. So those people without disease to compare to. Um, something that we really would like is um, patients and their family members. So perhaps a sister, a brother, mom, dad, um, son, daughter. We want to see if this is a disease that is passed down from generation to generation. 
So like they found in breast cancer, that there's a higher risk if you have a family member with that. In the future, we would hope to say, if it's true, we would hope to say, if your family member has cholangiocarcinoma, you should do these steps. Maybe um, you have a, you know, like in colon cancer, you would have a colonoscopy earlier than a typical person or a mammogram earlier than um, the typical recommended um, prevention strategy. And so ultimately we want to see how we can prevent the disease and how we can catch it earlier rather than later. So we would encourage you to participate. It's a really nice way. I found that um, family members feel kind of helpless when you get a diagnosis such as cholangiocarcinoma, but this is a way that they're able to contribute to the field um, and impact um, the research surrounding it. And then here are some references that we utilize. Um, I want to acknowledge the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation um, for being avid supporters of this project and providing us funding each year to um, do the consenting in blood draw and data abstraction. Um, the International Hepatobiliary Neoplasia Biorepository um, is a group of collaborators that uh, contribute samples. And then, like I said, the PSC Partners um, organization provided us with um, a grant to increase our um, patient population with PSC and cholangiocarcinoma. Um, ultimately, um, if you have questions, you can contact Dr. Lewis Roberts. Um, otherwise, uh, my information is available as well. It's also available on the website under uh, Enroll in a Genetic Study. And I thank you for being willing, uh, being able to present. Um, we're excited about the potential this work has, and um, we need patients like you to participate and help um, find a better um, way for us to treat this disease. So thank you, and I open the floor for Just questions. Thank you, um, Michaela, for that great presentation. So Fred has a question. He wants to know, um, can I sign up myself and immediate family members if they agree to participate, or must they sign up individually? And what about so children? like if I have children that are under the age of 18. Perfect, yes. So um, as long as you have the contact information for your family member, if they agree, you can fill out that contact form. Ultimately, they're going to need to sign the consent form. Um, typically, we do that via email. Um, and so it's pretty simple. Um, if you have uh, children under the age of 18, they are able to participate. Um, we just need an additional form filled out um, agreeing that um, they are a minor and that they are able to participate. So any age is available. There's no constraints as you might have diabetes. There's no um, eligibility criteria besides being someone willing to participate. Okay, um, and then we have, um, we have a pretty big following of international patients. So international patients, can they go to the same link and receive the same thing or do they have to go to one of your partners? Nope, they can go to the same link. Um, we have international shipping kits, which makes it super easy. Um, so international patients are more than welcome to apply um, and we encourage that as well. Okay, wonderful. Anybody else have any questions, please uh, type them into the chat or the Q&A box and we can get those answered. I know that this is one question that comes up to me all the time as I speak to patients and caregivers every day is, is you know, they always wanna know, is this a, a, a genetic disease? Is it hereditary? And as a patient and a mother of six, it's always on the top of my mind as well. So I'm gonna make a commitment to sign up because I have not followed through with this as well. And I'm gonna get all of my children to do so as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, and do know that when information is available um, that would influence your care or your family members, um, the Cholangiocarcinoma will, a Foundation will share that information with you. Um, so you don't need to follow anything else in particular, just the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation will share that information when it becomes available. Yes, wonderful, good point. And the thing is, is I know you said it may not provide immediate um, a benefit to the patients who are enrolling, but it, it should provide immediate benefit to our family members, right? Or to our children to know, you know, later or further down the road, the results of this. Correct. And I think that's what's most important to all of us as well. 
Um, all right, I don't see that we have any other um, questions, but for anybody who does, please, you can email me, you can email Dr. Lewis, um, and we will get those questions out so that we can get them answered. And I just wanna thank you both for your time today and for the great information. I very much appreciate it. And if you guys don't have anything, oh, let me see, there might be one more question. Oh, where can we access this recording? Yes, this will be recorded and Rick will get it up on the website as soon as possible. And we will also share it on our social media feeds so um, we can get it out to as many people as possible. Um, would, Fred also wants to know, um, as a member of Citizen, one of our, our partners, um, would it be helpful to have your organization have access to their medical records as well? Do you, do you ask for medical records from patients? So we do ask that there is um, a medical record provided that says that it's confirmed cholangial carcinoma. We are in the process of working with Citizen so that when you enrolled in this study, we would also be able to access your medical records through Citizen. Um, we're just working with uh, legal teams um, and our IRB to make sure that that is feasible. But um, that's a great point. We will uh, start working with Citizen in the near future um, to ensure that it's easier to get that clinical information. Wonderful, and I think that um, all the patients who have signed up for Citizen, if they're interested in enrolling in the clin either one of the research projects, um, the clinical trial, they should be able to share their medical information that way as well. And um, uh, Citizen will now be matching our patients to clinical trials as well, and we're gonna do that launch here in a couple weeks. So, um, so patients who match to, to your cl clinical trial, Dr. Funkwish, it should show up on their report as well, and they can connect with you that way as well. Great. Um, and Rick has put links to the Citizen and also to um, the GWAS study, and um, the link to the clinical trial is also on our website as well. We'll make sure we get that shared with the presentation too. And we're, we're gonna distribute the recording, so hopefully we can get the trials filled and you guys can get your information back to us as soon as possible. Absolutely, and we greatly appreciate uh, really uh, extending the invitation to present and for the attention of all the, the attendees. Thank you guys so much. You guys have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.